ألف لام را كتاب أنزلناه إليك لتخرج الناس من الظلمات إلى النور إلى النور بإذن ربهم إلى صراط العزيز الحميد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أنا الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه تسليم كثيرا أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله صلوات الله والسلام عليه تسليم كثيرا وشر الأمور محتثاتها وكل محتثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار as it has been announced, today's topic is concerning an issue that I think every Muslim realizes is danger and every Muslim, irregardless if he is a revert Muslim, Arab, non-Arab, rich or poor, if a person is a Muslim and he's living in the dunya at one point or another, He's going to hear about the seriousness of the issue of riba. And a lot can be said concerning the topic of riba, but uh, we wanted to point out some pretty important aspects that the ulama of al-Islam placed a lot of emphasis on because clearly it's an issue that al-Islam tried to tackle. I want to begin by first mentioning that Allah Azza wa Jalla, as everyone knows, He is the Khaliq and He knows His creation, Bani Adam, the fitra of Bani Adam. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned fitratullah, or the Quran mentioned fitratullah leti fitra nasa alayha. The fitra that Allah has put inside of everybody who is here. Adam's children, his daughters, his sons, they have a nature, a natural disposition. Certain things that they have that Allah created them that way, he planted that seed in them, and it's just like that. Some of them are good, and some of them are negative. The good things, the person has to develop it, he has to enhance it. And the negative things, the individual, he has to make jihad of his nafs to not allow it to overtake itself. If you look and you study the story of Adam sallallahu alayhi and what transpired between him and our mother Hawa in al-Jannah and with the shaitan, that story tells you a lot about aspects of the fitra of Bani Adam. How Bani Adam, they want to live a long time. So shaitan came and he whispered to Adam and he told him, هَلْ أُدُّلُّكَ عَلَىٰ شَجُتُ الْخُلْدِ وَالْمُلْكِ لَا يَبْلَىٰ Should I lead you, Adam, to a tree that will give you eternal life and it'll never go? Adam said, yes, he wants to live forever. A human being wants to live for a long time. So for you young people, for you young people, anytime you meet someone calling to jihad and all of that nonsense and he's encouraging you to kill yourself and you say yes to something like that, you're going against the fitra. The Nabi used to warn the people, No one should hope to die. No one should hope to die. The Nabi وسلم, told his companions, Men ahabba liqa Allah. Ahabba Allah liqa'ahu. Women kariha liqa Allah. Kariha Allah liqa'ahu. Whoever loves to meet Allah, Allah loves to meet him. Whoever hates to meet Allah, Allah hates to meet him. Our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, when she heard that hadith, she said, Ya Rasulullah, kulluna nakrahu liqa Allah. All of, us help, all of us hate death. Nobody wants to die. She understood that the hadith meant 
if you hate to die, then you hate to meet Allah. She said, all of us hate to die. He said, that's not the meaning of the hadith. The meaning of the hadith is when a person dies on Al-Islam and he has taqwa and he has deen and he has salah and ibadah and birru walidain and, and som and hajj, he died in a good way. When the people are taking him and he goes in the grave, the two angels, Munkar and Nakir, will sit him up, ask him questions. Ma dinuka, man rabbuka. What do you say about that man? If he answers the right way, those angels say, look to your left. That would have been your place in the hellfire if Allah didn't guide you aright. But Allah guided you right. He gave you tawfiq. Look to your right. That's your place in the Jannah. He'll look to his right and he'll see his place in the Jannah. And then he'll say, Allahumma aqim as Oh Allah established the hour. He wants to meet Allah. Oh Allah established the hour. Because he's dead. He wants Yom al Qiyamah to come. Whereas the person who's a munafiq, fajr, fasiq, mujrim, one who's a criminal, he comes. Madinuka, man rabbuka. What did you have to say about that man? He says about his Lord. Ha ha. La adri. I don't know. I never learned my religion. What's your religion? What's your religion? He says, I don't know my religion. What did you have to say about that man who came? He's gonna say, I heard the people saying something, so I said something. Hazir, nazir, ilm al ghayb, created from the nur of Allah. All of that stuff. They say, oh, you didn't answer the question correctly. Look to the right. That would have been your place in the Jannah had you answered correctly. Look to your left. That's your place in the hellfire. He'll make a dua and say, Allahumma la tuqum sa'a. Don't establish the hour. He doesn't want to meet Allah. That's the meaning of the hadith. That's the meaning of the hadith. For the person in the grave, whoever loves to meet Allah, because he's from the people of the Jannah, Allah wants to meet him. Whoever doesn't want to meet Allah, hates it. Allah doesn't want to meet him because he's going to go to the hellfire. In terms of the point that we're trying to make here today, Ikhwani, from the fitra of Bani Adam is everybody should want to live a long time. They asked the Nabi, who's the best in our community? He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Khayrukum man qala umruhu wa hasan amalu. The best of you is the one who lives a long time and he has good deeds. The longer he's able to live, the more sadaqah, the more tawbah, the more salat, the more juma, the more hajj, umrah, and so forth, so on. So the point here is the fitra of Bani Adam, Allah knows it. And from the fitra of Bani Adam, and everyone has this here, is love and money. Love and money. Love and money is from the fitra of Bani Adam, something that's inside of him. And he has to make jihad about this issue, not allowing it to overcome him or her. Allah Ta'ala established in many ayat of the Quran. Verily, Bani Adam, he is ungrateful to his Lord. And verily, he is a witness to that ungratefulness. He proved, his, he proved himself that he's ungrateful. He doesn't get up for Salat al Fajr. He doesn't pray five times a day. He doesn't appreciate. This is his mother and his father who Allah gave him life through his mother and his father, and he's nasty towards his mother and his father, so that is being ungrateful to Allah Azza wa So many issues. And the ayah said, and verily has an ardent love for money. He loves money. Al-insan, he loves money. He mentioned tabarak wa ta'ala in another ayat of the Quran, وَتَأْكُلُونَ التُّرَاثَ أَكْلٍ لَمْ وَتَأْكُلُونَ التُّرَاثَ you people devour the Torah. You devour the money of the orphans. Anytime Benny Adam gets an opportunity to get something that wealth is attached to it, he devours it. And he went on to mention in the end of the ayah, and you love money with an ardent desire, tremendous, fiery desire, money. It's from the fitr of Benny Adam. Yaqulu ahlaktu malin lubada. The human being, he brags. He says, I wasted this amount of money. I bought this, I bought that, I bought this, I bought this. Look at this. I, I, look what I spent for this. Exorbitant, exorbitant, astronomical amounts of money for things that are going to be a cause of his sorrow. But he brags about it. Look at this, look at that. So there are many ayat and many ahadith that established this first point. That Benny Adam, he loves money. He loves it. In an authentic hadith, 
that was collected by Imam al-Bukhari, Abu Huraira radiyallahu anhu ardahu, he said that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لو أن لابن آدم واديا من ذهب لا أحب أن يكون له واديان ولا يملع أوفاه أو جوفه إلى التراب ويتوب الله على من تاب He said from the nature of Ibn Adam is if you were to give the son of Adam a valley a wadi wadi is like where the water used to flow and now the water is dried up but the bank is still there it's a uh, where the water used to go, but it's, it's empty now. If you fill that place up with gold, the son of Adam is going to want another one. He's not going to be satisfied. He's going to want another one. And the prophet said, and nothing's going to fill up his body except dirt. He's going to die in dirt. He's not going to be able to take all of that with him. So that helps us understand one of the phenomenons that we find in the Muslim world, like where you come from. In the Muslim world, Pakistan, in Africa, when the Muslim leaders get in office, you would think that after 25, 30, 40 years of being the president or minister and accumulating all of that wealth by stealing, you would think after 15, 20 years, the man is going to ride off into the sunset and just go to Medina or Mecca and live the rest of his life. But they can't. They have to keep trying to run and keep trying to rig the ballot, keep trying to go, keep trying. You would think, man, that guy, he has, I don't even want to mention their names, but some of these leaders in the Arab world, in Egypt and other than them, he's been the leader for 20 years, 50 years, 60 years in Africa. That guy in South Africa, his name is Robert Mugabe. The man is almost 90 years old. What is he trying to lead the people for? Take your billions of dollars and just go and, and, and ride off into the sunset. He can't. And that's because the son of Adam, not just those leaders, just regular people. If you give him a valley full of gold, he's, he's not going to be satisfied. He wants another one. And if he gets another one, he'll want a third one and a fourth one. And all of those, again, are indications of the first point that we want to make. That Allah is with Jal. He created Bani Adam and he has a fiery, strong desire for wealth. And during this time, it's even more. During this time, it's even more severe. So the Nabi, he described this time, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he said, in another authentic hadith, لَيَأْتِيَنَّ عَلَى النَّاسِ زَمَانٌ لَا يُبَالِ الْمَرْ بِمَا أَخَذَ الْمَالِ أَمِّنَ الْحَلَالِ أَمِّنَ الْحَرَامِ The time is going to come where the people of this ummah won't care. Where did they get their money from? Did it come from halal? Did it come from haram? That's not important. What's important to the person today is that I got the money, that's it. So the individual, you will find him Muslim, back in the past, in the past. During the time of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if one of the companions loaned someone money, if he loaned him money, he took money from him, if the Eid came or some occasion came and that man who took the money, he took the money from him as a debt alone, if that man wanted to give him a gift, just a gift, not connected to the money, the one who gave the money wouldn't take it. He would say, I'm afraid that that's riba. I'm afraid that that's a bribe. He wouldn't take it. The man would insist, no, I'm giving you this really from the hadith of the Nabi, tahadu tahabu. Tahadu tahabu, give gifts, exchange gifts, and it'll cause you, cause you to love one another. It's one of the things that creates love between uh, the people. The man would insist, I'm not going to take the gift because you owe me money, and by me giving you the money, you giving me that additional thing, I'm afraid it has something to do with riba. If you were a person back then, during the time of the aslaf of this ummah, it was unthinkable that an individual have a store and in the store he sold Christmas cards. In the store he sold Valentine's Day cards. In the store he sold khamr. Khamr. The community would boycott him. He couldn't get married. No one's going to marry from his family. No one's going to want to be his neighbor. But today, today, that, that's not... Hey, you better bring that khamr in the store. That's what the people are telling him. You want to make money? Then bring the khamr in the store. So the point here is that the Nabi prophesies about this time, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the time that's close to Yawm Al-Qiyamah where 
the main goal and the objective of many people is just to make money, just to get money, just to get money. How is it possible that the Muslim knows about the importance of having halal money and the connection that that has on his dua, like the man who put his hands out, Ya Rabb, Ya Rabb, and he's asking Allah. We all have to ask Allah because we need all kinds of issues. And the Nabi Sallallahu mentioned, how is, uh, why is Allah going to accept his dua when his money is halal? His food is, his, his money is haram, his food is haram, his drink is haram, he's been nourished with haram, his clothes are haram. The money that he's using to eat from, that's why they call it aklur riba, aklur riba, to eat riba. He said the money that the individual is eating with, that's sustaining himself and nourishing himself, it came from the lottery money. When I lived in Keithley, when I first moved to the UK and I lived in Keithley, one of the Muslims of the local community won 14 million pounds from the lottery. 14 million pounds, a lot of money. But where's the barakah in that money? There's no barakah in that money. There's no barakah in the money that has been gained by what is haram, like riba. The Nabi said about riba, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inna riba wa in kathura fa inna ma'aqibatuhu fa inna ma'aqibatuhu tasiru qullin. He said riba, even if you have a lot of riba, even if you have a lot, he said ultimately it's going to be diminished and it's going to be a little. It's going to be a little because the individual is going to have to be responsible for it in front of Allah, Yom al -Qiyama. So that's the first point that we want to make before we even deal with this issue about riba. And that is from the fitrah of Bani Adam is loving money. Since Allah the Khaliq, he knew that his slaves love money, it would be oppressive for him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, to now leave them like that without giving them instructions in this religion. How to deal with the money. What is the money for and so forth and so on. And that's part of the beauty of Al-Islam. Unlike Christianity and Judaism, their religion, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. A lot of the stuff, what they believe in, it doesn't make sense. Some of the cultural Muslims in this city, Birmingham, London, Pakistan, this stuff that we believe in our religion doesn't make sense. And you young people, we don't want you guys to be like that. We don't want you people to be people who worship Allah. You don't know what you're doing, like the Yahud and the Nasara, making all of those claims. Muslims are the same way here in Derby. And I don't mean this in a bad way to put people down, but it's a reality. In our religion, the Nabi he saw his companion, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His companion his name was Ruwayfir. Ruwayfir, the small Rafir. He said, Ya Ruwayfi, la'alla al-hayat satutiru bika. It may be that you live a long time. You're going to outlive me. It may be. I don't know. If he knew the ilm al-ghayb, he wouldn't have said that. He would have known exactly when the man is going to die. He said, but you may live longer than me. He didn't know. He said, but I want to tell you something, Ruwayfi. If you do live longer than me, I want you to tell three Muslims who do three things, tell them that I'm free from them. I may not be there to tell them, so I want you to do it. Tell them, anyone who takes his lihya and he does like this and he twists it up, tell him I'm free. Because in jahiliyyah, arrogance, kibr, kibr. The emir, who's mutakabir, the rich person who's arrogant, he would twist his beard up and braid, have two braids like that. So as soon as you see him, you know this man has money. This man is the emir. And it was a sign of arrogance. So the Nabi said, hey, anyone who does that, tell him I'm free from him. He said, number two, Ya Rawayfa, any Muslim, anyone who you see, he ties some tamima, ta'weez. He ties a ta'weez around an animal, himself, his baby. Tell him I'm free from him. He wants his car to be protected, his camel to be protected, his baby to be protected. They put a ta'weez on him. Tell him I'm free. Both of those are clear. The beard is clear. Islam is against kibr. Islam is against shirk. And then he told him the third one. Listen to the third one, Ikhwani. Look at He said, Ya Rawayfa, if you see any Muslim, any Muslim, when he goes out to answer the call of nature, he has to go to the toilet, akramakum Allah. He has to relieve himself. If a Muslim goes out and he cleans himself with bones, 
or dry dung, like animal bones. An animal died, and he sees the bones, he picks it up, and he cleans himself. Or with dry dung, the animals themselves, they release the, uh, what they don't need, and the sun cooks it. It looks like a rock. He knows it's not a rock, though, and he uses it. It's going to be harmful to the person, the jarafim, something in that. The Nabi said, tell him also I'm free from him. Now the point that I want to make, Ikhwani, is our religion is a religion that makes sense. Not like the Yehud and the Nasara, Sikh, Hindu, like some of the Muslims, what they believe. The Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa in this hadith, he told Rawayfi, he told Rawayfi about an issue, the third one, it doesn't have anything to do with any of us. None of us. None of us are ever going to be in a position where we're going to clean ourselves with a bone or we're going to clean ourselves with dry dung. That hadith is for the Bedouins, the Bedouins who live in the desert, who use the bathroom in the de desert. It's for some of the people who live in Peshawar. For an example, you know, in the mountain areas, he's traveling and he has to clean himself out in the woods or something. But for us, it doesn't mean anything. Someone from Yemen, he's out in the Badia. It's, a, it's for those people. But for the people here, none of us have ever been, nor will any of us ever be in a situation where we're going to be confronted with that. Well, this hadith came to all of us. The prophet remembered to tell us about this hadith, but he forgot to tell us about any proof that shows we should do the molit. He forgot to tell us a single ayat, a single hadith in the sunnah, proving that we should do the molit. Anyone who says, yeah, we should do the molit, like our relatives will say, he can't bring you a clear ayat, can't bring you a hadith that's authentic to prove that. Our religion is not like that. Our religion is a religion that makes sense. For you men here, in Al-Islam, you can wear a ring. You can wear a ring on this finger, you can wear a ring on that finger, you can't wear a ring on these three fingers. The Nabi told us that. He remembered to tell us that, but he forgot to tell us about the molit. So the point that I want to make here right now with riba. In Al-Islam, Allah knew from the nature of Bani Adam is that Bani Adam loves money. So he's going to institute in this religion things to do and things that we shouldn't do. He said in the Quran, وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ صِدْقٍ وَعَدْلًا The religion of your Lord has been completed with sidq and al-adl. The words of your Lord, this religion, it is complete with the sidq. It's true what Allah said and what his prophet said. The opposite of kedim. It is adl. The opposite of dhul. He said in the Quran, وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبُّكَ رَبِّكَ الْحُسْنَى Your Lord, his religion has been completed with al-husna, with the, the best things. Halal and haram is that way because it, it's from the wisdom of Allah that khamr is not halal, that riba is haram and so forth and so on. And we have to believe that. When We revealed to you, Ya Muhammad, this book and it explained everything that you need to know. We didn't leave anything out of this book. So any Muslim who wants to come and he wants to know not only riba but all of the ways of making money that will destroy you, the Quran and the Sunnah clearly explained it to us. Ya ayu ladina amanu la ta'kulu amwalakum baynakum bil batil illa an takun an taradin illa an takun an taradin Don't devour your monies between yourselves with what is wrong. That ayat is general. Don't take the money, don't get the money from each other with what is wrong. So in the fiqh of Islam, in the fiqh of Islam, in the chapter of money, al-bay, bayur, there are many types of ways that are haram to get money. Many, many. People in Jahiliya were upon it, and the people today are upon it. And from the worst way is riba, riba. So concerning this issue of riba, the first thing that we want to mention, to remind you of, is that the riba is from the biggest sins in al-Islam. There are different sins, some are bigger than others. But the riba is from the biggest sins. It's from not only the kabair, but the akbar al-kabair. It's from the biggest of the major sins. Abu Huraira, and what was collected by Imam al-Bukhani, a Muslim, 
He said that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi told us Ijtanibu as saba al mubiqat Stay away from the seven sins that will destroy you He went on to mention them in chronological order At the top of the list as shirk billah Don't make shirk in any shape, form or fashion He said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sihr Stay away from magic in any shape, form or fashion Black magic or white magic. Stay away from all forms of magic. Number three, he mentions Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wa qatlu nafs alati haram Allah illa bil haq. Don't kill anyone. Don't kill anyone. Don't kill the unborn child, get an abortion. Don't do that. Don't drive recklessly and kill people. Don't sell khamar, people get drunk. Don't sell weed, people get high. They kill people or they, you cause them. To, you're going to be responsible for that. In no way in the world put yourself in a position where you're going to help directly or indirectly cause someone to lose their life. And the fourth thing he mentions, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Aklu riba. Don't eat a riba. The water, the, the money from a riba. He made it number four. It's from the seven major ones. He called it and he made it number four, Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala Ali Wasallam. From what also shows and clearly proves and indicates this point about riba is that riba not only is it from the kabair but it's from the biggest of the kabair is that the Nabi says sallallahu alayhi wa sallam dirham riba ya'kuruhu raju wa huwa ya'lam ashaddu indallahi ta'ala min sittim wa thirathin zunyatan A person who does riba and he knows that he's doing riba the dirham the dinar, the dollar, the franc, the pound. The person who takes a pound and he knows, he knows, he doesn't know. No problem if he doesn't know. But the one that he knows, this has riba in it. The Nabi said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it is worse than him making zina 36 times. Zina one time, just zina one time, is from the major sense. One dirham of riba, and he knows about it, the Nabi says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it is Ashaddu Indallahi min sittim wa thalathin zunyatan. It's more than 36 times of making zina. So there should be no doubt in the mind of the Muslim that Ariba is a major crime. It is not acceptable, Ikhwani, for someone who has a mortgage, someone who wants to get a car on finance, someone who has a credit card. It is not acceptable for that individual to say, ah, it's just a, don't be like that. Don't be like that. I'm not here to say to you, don't get a mortgage. And I'm not here to say to you, get a mortgage. I say, if you have a mortgage, take your situation to a scholar of the sunnah and tell him about your situation, your children, your job, and let him give you a fatwa. Let him judge in your case. Don't listen to every Amr Bakr and Zaid who walks from the community and he says yes or no. Because it's a big issue. It's going to affect your life. But one thing that we shouldn't do is we should not look at any aspect where there's a transaction with Reba in it. A person should never say, oh, it's, it's, uh, should never say that. It's a serious issue. And the one who has some wara and some taqwa, he'll, he's the one who's going to say, look, I, 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 I prefer just to stay away from it altogether. There are some situations that we cannot avoid. This is like that. Person has to have a bank account in order to get his check put into the bank account. He has to have a bank account. And that bank is dealing with riba and he himself is going to be dealing with riba. And the Nabi Wasallam cursed all of those individuals. But he's compelled. But Allah Ta'ala doesn't hold a, people, a person beyond his scope and his ability. Last point to show, inshallah, that riba is from the akbar al kabair is what you already know. The Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam he told the people inna abwab al riba ithnan wa sab'un baba adnahu kalladhi ya'ti ummuhu fil islam. He said that riba in the famous hadith it is 72 different types of riba. And this is important ikhwani. Riba is just not one type there are many types of riba. He said riba is 72 different types. He said the least amount of the riba, the least one is a man, like a man having relationships with 
his mother. Every time we hear that hadith, the fitrah of Bani Adam makes him say, A'udhu Billahi. A'udhu Billahi. That's, that's a problem. That's a problem. So all of that is an indication and a clear proof that riba is from the most serious issues in the dunya. Those kufar of Quraysh, they used to make money in many ways. They used to do highway robbery. They used to sell drugs, khamr. They used to steal the kufar of Quraysh. They used to engage in prostitution, akramakum Allah. They used to make money in a lot of ways. One of the main ways that they used to make money was riba. So when the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made the farewell hajj, hajjatul wada, he gathered up all of the people and he wanted to talk to them about a few issues because he knew that he was going to die. How did he know? Jibril came to him and said, you're going to die pretty soon. How did Jibril say that to him? Jibril said that to him because in the month of Ramadan that had passed, Jibril came to him every night twice. So the Nabi knew from Ishara, I'm going to die. So he started talking to the community that way, telling them things, hey, Ruayfet, it may be that you, you're going to live a long time and I won't. He started telling the community, whoever lives from you a long time, you're going to see a lot of ikhtilaf. Anyway, when he had gathered up the whole community, he told them many things. One of the things he said in the last farewell address is, all of the riba of jahiliyyah is haram. It's under my foot, haram. And the first riba that we're going to get rid of is the riba of my uncle Abbas. Anyone who Abbas gave you money and you owe him the money, the principal and the interest, you don't have to pay that interest anymore. By the Prophet using his uncle, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and destroying his uncle's riba, then everybody else in the community knows, hey, you can't ask the people for that extra money that you were telling them that you should give. So before he died, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in this religion, in this religion before he died, he made this issue very clear and he closed the door. So the Kufar of Quraysh, what they used to do when they didn't want to give up their riba, is they used to say crazy things. They said, when you buy and you exchange, you know, you do transactions, they said, buying and trading is like riba. I buy this for $1, one pound, and I sell it for one pound, 50 pence. One pound, 50 pence. So that extra 50 pence, I'm looking for the profit. They, they said, they said, Reba is the same way. It's the same way I loan to you one pound and I say, give me back one pound and 50 and 2% and, and, and of what I gave you, whatever. They said it's the same thing. Allah Ta'ala addressed that. No. Allah made al-bay halal and he made riba haram. So the point is, we don't want to be of those people who came today and they try to justify what's going on. Riba is one of the major sins in Islam. Second point, that we want to mention concerning the issue of the riba is that if you looked at this Quran, Ikhwani, if you looked at this Quran, especially concerning the sins, the Quran has a lot of secrets and they're only considered to be secrets because some people understand and some people don't. The people who have been endowed with knowledge like the ulama, especially the ones from the past who helped to bring out these treasures and people today they understand the asrar of the Qur'an. If you look in the Qur'an, there's not a single ayat in the Qur'an that mentions a sin that a person can do and Allah Ta'ala has threatened the person who did that sin that he's going to wage war against that person. The only ayat that mentioned that is the ayat of riba. There are different ayat that say, if you do this, Allah won't speak to you, Yom Qiyama. Allah won't purify you, Yom Qiyama. Certain ayahs say, if you do this sin, you're going to be raised up with the criminals. Certain ayahs say, if you do this particular sin, you're going to get a grievous punishment. They describe different things. There's no ayah in the Quran that mentions the person who does this sin, Allah Azza wa Jalla has declared war against him. Allah and his messenger. Even people who fight against Islam, Allah never mentioned. If you fight against the religion, Allah has declared war against you and his messenger. But for the one who takes riba, he made that, he made that threat. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya ayu al-ladheena aminu taqullah wa dharu ma baqiya min riba in kuntum mu'mineen. 
فَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا فَأْذَنُوا بِحَرْبٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ O you believe, give up all of the desire that you have that remains. Give up all of what remains of your desire for riba. Give it up if you are truly believers. And if you don't give it up, then you should know that Allah Ta'ala has declared war against you. Him and his messenger. Abdullah ibn Abbasin, radiallahu anhu, who was the one who understood the Quran better than all of the other companions, radiallahu anhu ajma'in, because of the dua that the Prophet made to Allah for him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said in an authentic ather that yawm al-qiyamah, the person who died and he's raised up, and he was a person who was taking riba, it's going to be said to him, use your weapon, get your weapon, and you fight your war with Allah Azza wa Jal. And obviously everyone knows that that was his way of just telling the person that the individual who this is his situation is really serious. It's not a small thing. So if a person has fallen into riba because of he can't get out of it, it's just like that, then that's one thing. But the Muslim shouldn't look at the riba as being a, so, a, a small issue. It has some serious ramifications. From them, and we want to mention this, is that, again, Khwani, Every sin in Islam, every sin in Islam is not the same. Some sins are more severe than others, but one type of sin that the person wants to avoid is the sin that has been described as the one who is doing it, he gets the curse of Allah upon himself. Al-la'na. Whenever the Muslim says to someone, la'na tullah alayk, and we shouldn't do this. The Prophet described the believer and he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, laysa al-mu'min the Muslim shouldn't be a person who talks bad about people. His lineage, his father, his mother, his mother, just bringing out the bad points about people. He said, don't be like that. Make a ta'an. And some people, unfortunately, especially people who practice the religion. I see this from experience. People who claim to be from al Hadith, people who claim to practice the religion, from all of the masajid. We're some of the worst people when it comes to talking about other people. And it comes from Asabiya. It comes from Hizbiya. He's in that masjid, so I'm going to say nasty things about him. He's a competitor, so I'm going to say nasty things about him. He said, the believer is not like that. The believer is careful about what he says about other people. And he said, the believer doesn't say, Lana Allah all the time. Lana Allah, Lana Allah. The Prophet was about to travel, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he was going to go and make jihad. And he needed all of his people. He needed all of his weapons. He needed all of his horses, everything. One man's horse was giving him trouble. And the horse wasn't working with the man. He was being stubborn and moving around, going up in the air. And he knocked the man off. The man jumped up off the ground and said, Lana to Allah on you, horse. May Allah curse you, horse. The prophet said, hey, hey, hey. Let that horse go. Take off the saddle. Take off the bridle and let him run off into the desert. We're not going to go in jihad. We need the barakah of Allah. When you say lana to Allah on something, you're asking Allah to take his rahmah off of that thing. We need the rahmah of Allah on that horse and on us and our weapons and our family and our house. We find now the mother will get upset, the father will get upset, the husband will get upset, the wife will get upset. First thing we say is, may Allah curse that individual. So the point here is, we want to avoid the sins like that. And I have to mention this, Ikhwani. Some of you may think the only sins where la'na has been used in the Quran and the Sunnah are real big things. Yeah, it's only used for big things. But big things to Allah and His Messenger, but not big things to us. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he said that the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, la'na Allah. May Allah curse the lady who plucks her eyebrows, the one who does it to her, and the one who has it done. And unlike us, the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he would never say la'na to Allah and make dua on someone like that, except it was serious. So the Muslim man, he has to look at his situation. He has to say to his daughters, he has to say to his wife, he has to be in a position to say, hey, you can't go out. You have a religious responsibility. Who in his right mind wants someone who's cursed to be in their house? You don't want your loved one to be cursed. 
So the scholars used to write books just mentioning the things that Allah and his messenger curse, the sins, so people can know, try to avoid it. So concerning riba, he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, La'anallahu akil riba wa mukilahu wa shahidehi wa katibahu. Allah has cursed the one who takes the riba. Allah has cursed the one who gave the riba. Allah has cursed the two people who witnessed the riba. Allah has cursed the one who just came and he wrote it down. And that's important because in the times of a jahiliyyah, the ayat in the Quran, the last ayat in the Quran is the ayat of a dain, of the debt, the debt. So many people couldn't read and write. And the last, the ayat of the dain, the last, the longest line ayat, Allah commanded people that we have to write the dain down. When you give someone a debt, it's wajib. You have to write it down. And you have to take two witnesses. You can't just give someone some money and that's it. You have to write it down. And he said, let the one who knows how to write, let him write it. But when it comes to riba, the prophet said that hadith, Allah has cursed the one who writes it down to let the person know. Hey, if people invite you, come, come. You didn't give riba. You didn't take riba. We just want you to write it. You're a cat tip. Write it down. You say, I can't even write it down because the one who is writing it down is cursed. And he said they all are equal in the sin. So it's a kabirah from the kabair. And the one who falls into it has been cursed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another issue about riba, ikhwani, and this is important, is what I mentioned earlier. No matter how much riba a person is gaining, it's going to be reduced. And not only is it going to be qalil, it's going to be qalil in the final analysis, but it also is going to be a problem. It's going to make the person lowly. They call it in Arabic dhulul or adhul, to be put down. He said about himself in the Quran, Yam haqullahu riba. Yam haqullahu riba. Allah Azza wa has reduced the riba. He reduced the barakah. He reduced it from being accepted. The Nabi said, no matter how much riba a person gets, it's going to be reduced. So look at this ummah and look at the hadith of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Look at our ummah and look at this hadith about a riba. Even if riba is a lot, it's going to be a cause for people to be lowly and down. He told this ummah in prophesizing what was going to happen and what is happening right now. قَالَ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ إِذَا تَبَعَيَنْتُمْ بِالْعِينَ وَأَخَذْتُمْ أَذْنَابَ الْبَقَرِ وَرَضِيتُمْ بِالزَّرْعِ وَتَرَكْتُمْ الْجِهَادِ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْكُمْ ظُلًّا he said to this ummah, you Muslim men, if you start doing al-ina, which is one of the 72 types of riba, many different types of riba, if you start being people who do usury, if you do that, and you grab onto the tails of the cows, meaning you become preoccupied with mining the fields and stuff, having goats and sheep and all of that, the dunya. Number three, if you become preoccupied with az-zara, with agriculture, and you leave off al-jihad, fi sabirillah, Allah Azza Jal is going to make you people low. He's going to put you people low. And he won't raise that off of you until you return back to your religion. So if we were to look in the world today, we will find, we will find. In the Muslim countries, especially like in the Gulf states, who seem to be some of the richest people in the face of the earth because of the petrol. They have a lot of money. They have money where they can have the World Cup in the middle of the desert, in the summertime, wintertime. It's irrelevant. And in order to make it nice, they can put air conditioning in that place. They don't care. I don't know how many of you people have been to Dubai and you saw the Baruj of Dubai. The amount of money that the Arabs spend, and I'm not talking down about the Gulf State Muslims because we all have problems in Africa where I come from, in Africa. Africa is the richest continent on the face of the earth. No other place has the resources of Africa. Everything that's important to Benny Adam in terms of petrol, uranium, everything, gold, diamonds, it's all in Africa. Look at the Muslims wherever they are, wherever they are. Pakistan, they have the the, the that bomb, the nuclear bomb, they have, they have surpassed 
most people scientifically in the race with nuclear weapons. But Allah Azza wa despite that, put the Muslims down in a position where our necks are under the feet of the non-Muslims. We can't exist without the non-Muslims. Banking system has to be the way of the non-Muslims. And some of you actually think, and it's kind of funny and sad at the same time, you ask someone, who do you bank with? They'll say the Islamic Bank of Britain. Now, I'm not against the Islamic Bank of Britain as such, but just because it says Islamic Bank of Britain, he's going to be with that bank, thinking that there's no riba. He's going to get a mortgage with the Islamic Bank of Britain. There are no mortgages without riba. You take that as a, you take that as a qaid, as a principle. The only mortgages that don't have riba is if you meet someone and you say, can I borrow some money from you? Give me 20,000, 30, 50, 100,000 pounds and I'll pay you back over this period of time. The man says, okay. And he doesn't charge you riba. As for getting a mortgage from any and every bank, don't allow that thing, Islamic Bank of Britain, to trick you and to fool you. And the Nabi, he prophesied about that. He said that the time was going to come. One of the signs of Yom Al-Qiyamah is that people would name things by other than their real names. They'll call Khamr instead of calling it Khamr. And they'll call it um, Ar-Ruh, Riba. Instead of calling it Riba, they call it Rib, Prophet. The fact that a person changed the name of the thing has nothing to do with the reality. It's what is actually taking place. So the point here, Khwani, in the shadow of the Kalam is when the Ummah did those things that the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam warned about, we find as a result of that, a direct result of that, one of the things that the Ummah of Al-Islam have been inflicted with is this thing where we are people who are lowly. Our countries are lowly. We have the ability to start our own banking system for an example is difficult because there are a lot of a lot of a lot of adversity concerning it and a lot of opponents against it but the muslims won't really try to go after that exalted and high issue because it's not that easy it's easier just to go ahead and deal with the system that has been already implemented and it's been implemented by people who are the enemies of allah and the enemies of mankind they are blood suckers. They are blood suckers. And in Islam, they're called that as well. They're called blood suckers, the people who take advantage of the people. From what we want to mention is, Kwan, concerning this issue of the riba, is that, as I told you, riba is not like salat where a person is praying every day, so there are things about the salat that everybody comes to know about. There are some hidden things in a riba that many people don't know about. But because we're living in the time where money is important and everybody has some type of financial tra transaction that he's dealing with, this issue goes to show the importance of the Muslim learning his religion. Doesn't have to be a scholar, as we always say, but he has to know enough about his religion where he knows what he's doing. He wants his money to be halal. He wants to be able to make dua to Allah in his dua. He's in a position to have that dua accepted. He wants to know how to navigate. So in the past, right now, if you look at all of those books of fiqh, all of the books of hadith, all of them, they start off the book of Al-Iman, the book of how revelation started to come, and then it starts with the tahara, wudu, al-ghusl, the salat, then zakat, and after the zakat comes the issue of a psalm, then the issue of al hajj, and then the issue of three things either al bayt, or al jihad, or al nikah. All of the books of hadith are like that. After those five arkan of Islam, gonna come al nikah, al jihad, or al bayt. But the majority of the books are the books of al bayt, transaction. And that is a way that the scholars of Islam took care of showing this ummah that knowing how to deal with your money, it is important. Because if you don't know how to deal with your money, those five arkan of Islam, that stuff will compromise your salah, your zakat. Person doesn't even know how to make zakat, what do you make zakat on? That thing, not knowing how to trade, buy and sell, it will make a problem. Last two points that I want to make before we open up the door for question and answers 
if we are sitting here and we're talking about riba, we mentioned from the hadith that riba has 70, 72 branches, 72 branches. The Nabi said that the highest form of riba, arba riba al istitala fi ird akhik al Muslim. He said the highest form of riba and the worst form of riba is for you to talk bad about your Muslim brother, to make riba about someone, to be an individual who talks about. So we come and we want to learn about riba, being an individual who wants to avoid riba. He's avoiding riba, he's really making jihad not to fall into riba. But he's making one of the worst kinds of riba because his tongue is loose. And he says this about that one, says this about that one, says this about this one and that one, that one, that one. And it just goes to show the comprehensive nature of our religion. Don't be of the individuals who pay a lot of concern to issues like this problem in Syria that's really distressing. The problem of the people who are calling and they are saying, we want to free the Muslim world, we want to establish a khilaf and we want to make jihad and they're killing people innocently. Last night, as many of you know, I traveled throughout West Africa to give Dawah in West Africa. And my people in Africa are messed up, just like people in Pakistan. Shirk, left, right, and center. I'm talking, Ikhwani, about Muslims going and worshiping, worshiping dead chickens. The chicken is dead. And the person in Africa worshiped dead chicken. The man who's the sheikh is allowed to marry 98 women, 98, and use Dalil, and no one says anything because he has barakah. Things that if I were to see here, you wouldn't believe some of the stuff that they do. Allah blessed one part of Nigeria, it's called Zaria, with a brother, a sheikh has knowledge. Muhammad Awal Albani is his name. African, that's his name. For the last few years, he has been teaching, helping the people to memorize the Quran. Hijab, Jilbab, Niqab. He built two schools. He's calling to Islam. In Nigeria is a group called Boko Haram. They're the guys who kill you if you disagree with them. <laughs> Terrorists. This brother, this sheikh, he doesn't talk about them. If you ask him, he'll say that's not the right way, but he's not antagonistic against them. All he's teaching in this community, Tawheed, az zakat Salat, Ahkam of Islam, and so forth and so on. And last night, when he was coming from his darasat to Salat al-Isha, they followed him and shot him up in the car with his wife and his son, innocent people, pulled him out of the car and and, and riddled his body with more bullets. Boko Haram. And if you were to ask these people, why did you do that? This is not a man who's a threat. He doesn't say Reba is halal. He doesn't say let's judge by other than what Allah revealed. He doesn't say the government is a good government. He's taking the Muslims, their sons and daughters, and he's teaching them Tawheed and love of the Sunnah. Why did you kill him? They're going to answer Jihad, fi sabirillah. So what's the point? What's the point? If we're talking about riba, it's our hak to talk about riba. But let's not be of those people. I'm an individual. I want to avoid riba. It's a serious thing. But here I am, an individual. The Nabi said the worst form of riba is an individual who talks bad about his brother. Talks bad. Saying things about people. It may even be true. But what's the benefit of what you're saying? It's riba. It's no benefit. So the call is to return back to the application of our religion to the best of our ability. And no doubt, as we mentioned, a lot of things that can be said concerning Reba, inshallah, during the Q&A session. Maybe some of those things will come out. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his tawfiq and to give us the success. Barakallah feekum wa ahsanallah ilaykum.